God, you are compassionate. You are merciful. You are gracious, having great favor towards us. He loves you. Having great favor, that's the God that we serve. Welcome to the family room. Are you ready for today? Today's communion. Oh, I need, I know, man. It's been a little bit since we've had communion. I need that. We need to be reminded of, of just his goodness and his love and his mercy. And, and very cool. Normally we're in the uh, gospel of what? Matthew. Yes. Gospel of Matthew. Going verse by verse through the gospel of Matthew. But I'm going to take us on a little diversion today. Uh, what's new, huh? Um, Exodus 33, just kind of camp, camp it out there for a minute, and I'll show you why we're going over there. Exodus 33, Lord, you are so, so faithful to us. Lord, it's so good to be your child. You didn't call us, Lord, to, to be religious or to hold on to some system of do's and don'ts, Lord. You simply called us to be your child. So we come away from this world, Lord, and man, there's so many that are hurting and broken, Lord, and yet you're there. You're there for us, Lord, knowing that we're loved, knowing that we're forgiven. And in this very room, Lord, if we'll listen with our hearts, Lord, you're in this place. You promised us, Lord, and we're going to claim that promise. Whenever we'd gather together, you would be in our midst. And Lord, we need you. We really, really love you. We'll open our Bibles. We'll open our hearts to you. We need you, Jesus. We trust in you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen and amen. All right. There was a passage that we hit last time that I'd really like to spend like four or five Sundays on. I'm not going to do that. I spent some time last time on it. I kind of want to take it in a different direction. But it was in, we're in, we're in Matthew chapter 9, and it says this. It says, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. And that stopped me in my tracks, that moved with compassion. We can have compassion, but if we're not moved to do something about it, then something's wrong. He says, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. We talked about this last time. I told you there's a lot of things in this life that I can't just look the other way. With, with, with us being followers of Jesus, what would he have us to do for this particular situation or whatever it is? And there's just things you just can't look the other way. And no, nor should we. If God is prompting you to move out to do something, then do it. And we're seeing this over and over again with the characteristics of who Jesus is. And he's teaching us these things, how to love, how to forgive, how to deal with weird people. I mean, welcome to Calvary. It's filled with weird people. Yeah, huh? look around. <laughs> Yes, if, if you think you're normal, well, you're probably the weird one, right? So, but so we do a lot of this because on Sunday morning, we're really stay in the New Testament. We've done that all of our, our time together. Uh, and then on Wednesday night, we'll go through the Old Testament. We've been through the entire Bible several times in our church. But I want to take you over to Exodus, and we're going to look at that here in just a minute. The reason is, is that when I look at Jesus and see what he's doing, I'm also seeing the Father. I'm also seeing the work of the Holy Spirit. And without getting into a whole thing on the Trinity, which we did just recently and on these Sunday mornings, um, you know, when Jesus said to Philip, he said, when, when you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. And I've taught you this. I've taught you this, that one of the things that they were having problems with Jesus was not that he was calling himself God, because that really wasn't the problem. And if you're not familiar with this, stay tuned. We'll get to it again. But, but that he was calling himself Yahweh. He was calling himself the God. It's not that he was calling him God, plural. He's calling himself the God, Yahweh. And that was a huge problem. The Bible says this, for in him, speaking of Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's kind of a, kind of a very theological way of saying when you see Jesus, you see the Father. When you see Jesus, you see the Holy Spirit. When you see Jesus, you see the Trinity, whether we understand it or not. I think when we get to heaven, and we're going to be there pretty soon, some of you sooner than others, uh, but, but when we finally get to heaven, I think we're going to look at, at God and say, oh, that's how it works. Because the Bible says we look through a glass dimly, but on that day, face to face. Someday soon, we're going to see him face to face. 
And I think a lot of the stuff we struggle with, and if you, don't, if you don't struggle over the Trinity, then you haven't studied it at all. You know, how can that work out? And yet, on that day, we're going to see him. But I'm going to take you over to Exodus, because I really want to talk about the Father today. Because we, we talk about Jesus all the time. We're going to continue talking about him for a long time. But I want to talk about the Father. Because when we've seen Jesus, we've seen the Father, and we see the same characteristics in the Father. And it's easy to get in our minds that we got Jesus that we love, that we follow, and the Father that's kind of, he's telling them to go in and kill people and do stuff. So it's a different God. It's not a different God. It's a different time period. It's a different group of people that he's dealing with and all of that. But I take it back to the Exodus story because you got Moses. Moses is dealing with a whole bunch of bozos. They came, out of the, they came out of this slavery out of Egypt. The great victory there was as they finally were set free from that. They started having children, and their children started having children. It was, a, it was a great big monster group that was following, and they were griping a lot. And God told Moses, look, come up, come up to this mountain. Everybody needs to stay down there, just you, Moses. You come up here, and I want to give you some instruction on how, how, to, how, to, how to deal with these people and, and some of the commandments that will help them in their walk. So cut out, cut out a couple stones and bring them up here, and, and I'll write on them. And so he gets up there the first time. He does this, has to do this a couple of times. The first time he gets up there, about halfway through their time together, God said, hold on, Moses. You got to go back down. The people are freaking out. He gets back down there and, you know, he's, he's up there having a great moment with God. He goes down and sees the people. You know what they did? They created a golden calf and they're dancing around, you know, some of them, they even got clothes on, they're dancing around, woo, you know, worshiping this thing. And Moses goes, what are you doing? Aaron, I gave you the instruction to, to, to watch over the people. What did you do? And Aaron lied, you know. He said, well, I, I took their, their earrings, I took their golden earrings, I threw them in the fire, and out magically came this calf. <laughs> you know, that's a lie. Just look at the story. The story actually tells us the truth, that he carved it. He made this golden calf for them to worship. Well, without getting in that whole story, because that's not one we want to land on, is this, is that, is that Moses is, is, Lord, if... I'm not going to do this anymore if you don't go with us. You know, and God's kind of saying, God's telling him, look, uh, I'm with you, but I'm not going to be with you. I'm going to send angels with you. I'll take care of you. But you guys are really ticking me off, you know. And, and, and they're having this, this discussion in, in 32, 33, and that whole section of, in Exodus. They're having this story. But I love Moses, what he does. Moses is saying, look, God, he says, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up here. That's in, that's in verse 15 of chapter 33. Lord, don't. I don't want to go. I don't want to go if you're not going with us. You have to go with us. I've been following God a long time, and the longer I follow God, the more I get that. I don't want to do this if you're not with us, Lord. I don't want to move out if you're not with us. I don't want to lose that touch of the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm talking about? Hey God, if you're not with us, I don't want to go. And then he, then he says this, and we'll go, well, God tells him, he says, look, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go with you. You have great grace that I placed upon you. And I love this little line here. He says, and I know your name. I know you, Moses, child of God. He knows you. He knows the things that you struggle with. He knows the things that keep you up at night. He knows you. He knows your name. You talk about name, you're talking about the character. You're talking about an intimacy. I know you. I know you. Then he says this, okay, then I want to I see, look at this, look at verse, where's it at? Verse 18, he says, show me your glory. Show me your glory. I want to see you, Lord. Now, I understand this in this sense. Whenever I travel, whenever I'm gone somewhere, and, and uh, I like talking to my wife on the phone, I love talking to my grandkids and my kids, you know, but it's not the same without being in their presence. 
I can look at pictures of them. I can even do FaceTime with them, you know, but it's not the same. I love that my daughter and her kids are here, but I have another daughter that's in Las Vegas and, and because the job has taken them there. And, and I, I don't like that. I just say straight up, I don't like that at all. I don't like them being away from us. I don't like seeing them growing up on, on Facebook or any of this. I want to be with them, you know, because they're, you know, and I don't, I'm a grandpa, all right? I don't want to be with them all the time, all right? There's times I don't want to be around them, but most of the time I want to be around them. I get to hang out with them next week. Praise God. I'm looking forward to that. But there's something about that, that I want to be close to them. I want to see them. That's Moses here. Show me your glory. I want to be with you, Lord. It's one thing talking to you, but I, ha- I can't see you. You know, I, don't, I, I, w- I want to see your glory. He says, he says, I'll make all my goodness pass before you. We're in verse 19 now. And I'll proclaim to you, and I'll be gracious to whom I'm gracious with, I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion on. And say, so you cannot see my face. No man can see me and live. Here's the place by me. And you shall stand in the rock over there. It shall be that when my glory passes, verse 22, when my glory passes, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover you with my hand while I pass by, and I'll take away my hand, and you shall see the word here in the New King James is my back. My face you shall not see. You can't see my face. You can't see my face. It's, it's too much. You'll just, you'll just, you'll just evaporate. You'll just, maybe that's what that whole spontaneous combustion is. You ever see that? It's like, like in the path, people just all of a sudden they're going down the street and they just catch on fire. That's kind of weird. That actually sounds demonic. All right, I'll leave that alone. But, but the thing is this, how about, how about this? It's like the Indiana Jones thing. Your face is going to slide right off your skull. You can't see me like that. But I love what he says. He says, but I'm going to put you in the cleft of a rock. I'm going to put my hand over it. And when I pass by... New King James says, says, you're going to see my back. The word is this, is you're going to see my afterglow. It's where we get our word afterglow from. We get our idea of that. You're going to see my afterglow. In other words, you can't see me in this flash, and you can't see me, but you're going to, you're going to see who I am. So he said this. Now he broke the first Ten Commandments because of the, them dancing around the golden calf. He says, now make a couple more, you know, stones and, and, uh, and I'll write on them, but come up here tomorrow. He said, you know, what do you say? Make two tablets and call me in the morning kind of thing. And so, and he said in the morning, so could you imagine, oh, man, I get to see God tomorrow. I don't think he slept that night. The joy of the joy of seeing the father, seeing, seeing God. I get to see his afterglow. Whatever that means now, he doesn't know yet, but I know that there's going to be a radical moment. And then it says this, verse 5, and we'll, stand, we'll stay here for a minute. It says this, Then the Lord descended in the clouds and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. He's passing by. He's got his hand over. He's passing by. And all of a sudden, the Lord passed by before him, takes his hand back, and he says, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh God, okay, the Yahweh, right, Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, covenant name of God, Yahweh. And then he gives a description of Yahweh. What is that? Yahweh. Oh, let me, let me do this. I don't want to miss this just for a moment. Let, let's hold on to that story. Yahweh in your Bible, L-O-R-D in all caps, um, how do we say that name? Y-H-W-H. How, how do we say that name? You can't say it because there's no vowels in it. That was intentional. It's such a holy name that the, those that were the scribes were saying, you know, we're not going to, we don't want to say this is a holy name. This is a holy name. In fact, even today in Judaism, they won't say Yahweh. They wouldn't print it on my ring, Yahweh, all right? Because the Jewish culture that was there is, uh, they'll say the name if you say it to an Orthodox Jew today, the name, they know what you're talking about. They know you're talking about Yahweh, the name. Just like you talk about the wall, the wall. They know it's the wailing wall. And so they have this, this thing with, with the name. So we took the name, so we took the, the, the words for Adonai and Elohim, two other names for God in the Old Testament. Adonai and Elohim, we took the, the vowels out of that and dropped it in the YHWH. 
Thus you have Yah from Adonai, Yahweh from Elohim. And this is the vowels from that. And that's where we get, that's where we get Yahweh from. You get Jehovah, there's no J sound, but it'd be Yehovah, because they just took the vowels from Adonai. This is more technical, probably not necessary for this study, but, but just so you know when you look in your Bible, all right, uh, Yehovah. We slurred into the English Jehovah, but Yeh- Yehovah. Okay, it comes from, from the Adonai. The A and the O from Adonai, from the, the, the vowels and that, dropped it in this word to, to give us a... Now, the thing is this, we got the, they for sure got the Yah right, right? Because we find that in Psalm 68. It says, sing to, the, sing to God, sing to praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the mountains by his name, Yah, a shortened version of Yahweh, but it's Yah, and rejoice before him. So we know from that psalm, we know that we got that first part's right. Yah, is it Yahova? Is it Yah? What does it really matter? You know, you can. It, it, it's interesting. Okay, in your Bible, it's interesting to look at some of these words. What does that have to do with the text? A little bit, but we can. We'll, we'll go past that now. But but he says Yahweh, Yahweh. He's God. And then he gives, and this is, this is perfect for communion, perfect for meditating on. This is the attributes of God. He is, notice this, he is merciful. He's merciful. Some of your, some of your Bibles have the word compassionate right there. And as I go through these words real quickly, is that I'll, I'll use, there'll be a couple different ways of looking at them because your Bibles, because you have this, this Hebrew word and it can be translated merciful, it can be translated compassionate. Okay, I think they're both beautiful. God, you are compassionate. You are merciful. You are gracious, having great favor towards us. He loves you having great favor. That's the God that we serve. Long-suffering. I like one of the translations. It's slow to anger. God is slow to anger. God is patient. If he wasn't patient, he would have killed us long ago. He is so, so patient. Abounding in goodness. Again, the word goodness there can also be translated mercy abounding in mercy. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Lamentations 3. Man, it's the morning. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Thank you, God, for the morning. I don't know about you, but in the morning, I like the mornings better than I don't like the evenings. I do good in the morning. Maybe you're not like this, but man, I do really good in the morning. It's evenings I have to be careful. The demons come out at night. Hello. Okay, I struggle at night sometimes. It's the nights that I have to be careful of. But I praise God that His mercies are new every morning. You ever get up in the morning, you just go, God, thank you for forgiving me, Lord. Forgive me for all that I did yesterday. Maybe you're not like that. And I'm not going to confess too much right now because I still need this job for a while. But... but <laughs> But his mercies are new every morning. I'm so thankful for that. Good time, good time is, to, is to seek God in the morning. You know, in the morning, will I commit my heart to you, God, in the morning. And in the evening, I'm asking God to help me. Help me get through this night and help me get through this time. You know, the morning. His, his mercies are new every morning. He's abounding in goodness. He's abounding in mercy. He's abounding in truth. Faithfulness, some of your, your Bibles have here. Abounding in truth. It's not the truth, though the truth will set you free. The, the idea of the truth here is the, a person of truth, right? He's, he's a person of faithfulness. He's a person of truth, right? So he's abounding in truth. He's maintaining or keeping mercy to thousands, generations, to thousands and thousands, he's, he's maintaining mercy. He's forgiving our iniquities, perversities, depravities. He's forgiving our iniquities, our transgressions, our rebellions. He's forgiving our sins. When I, when I look at who God is, it's easy to think, well, I have Jesus, but the God of the Old Testament is a little harder to deal with. He's all these things we're talking about. Well, keep reading, Pastor. Look what it says. 
Well, your life will, will, will affect those around you. By no means clearing the guilty, Vis- visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. By no means clearing the guilty. Our lives, this is important right here, our lives will affect those around us. What we do will affect those around us. It'll affect our kids. It'll affect our grandkids. It'll affect our neighbors. It'll affect those around us. You know, isn't, you know how many times have you heard stories of someone that a dad that was abusive, a dad that was abusive or an alcoholic, and the kid though doesn't want to be like that. I don't want to be like my dad. I don't want to be like that. And yet the kid becomes the same thing. I have a really good friend that his dad was a pastor and uh, his dad was an alcoholic. His dad was a pastor. Eventually the, pa- the, the church threw him out, locked him out of the church, you know, and that was serious because they had the parsonage and all that of the church and they got kicked out of where they were living and the whole thing. And uh, this guy, this guy's fairly well known and he struggled all of his life. He's a guy that loves Jesus and he's, he's been an alcoholic most of his life too. He just picked, picked it up from dad, you know. So it says here, now, what is Moses doing? He's going up on the mountain to receive from God, all right? He's got these clean slates now that God is going to write the Ten Commandments. And God repeats this right here in the Ten Commandments. He says, by no means, this is part of the Ten Commandments, by no means clearing the iniquity, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the children's children to the third and fourth generation, all right? And what does it say? To those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. To those who hate me. It's all up to the kid. It's all up to each one of us. Deuteronomy 5, when he repeats this, he repeats the exact same thing, for those who hate me. In Ezekiel, when it comes up, it says this. It says, Ezekiel chapter 18 says this, the soul who sins will die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. The soul who sins will die, but the son will not bear the guilt of the father, it says. God is not contradicting his word. What he's saying is, is what we do in this life will affect those around us. But the thing is this, and again, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, except to really be meditating on this. What, what is the God that we serve? Okay, I love talking about Jesus, and we'll continue to talk about It's all about Jesus. We'll talk about him. But we talk about the Father. He's merciful. He's compassionate. He's gracious. He's slow to anger, long-suffering. He's patient with us. Thank you, God. I'm so thankful for that. He's long-suffering. He's abounding in goodness and mercy. He's abounding in the truth and faithfulness. He's maintaining or keeping the love, the mercy to thousands of generation after generation. He's forgiving us our iniquity, our wickedness, our rebellion, our sins. We need to meditate on that, not just let this fly over our head and move past it and all that. We need to realize that the God that we serve really does love us, really wants the best of us, you know. And when I come to the communion table, there's a couple things about that. One of them is it reminds me of what Jesus has done for me. That's how much God loves me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And when I hold on to the bread, I'm remembering what he's done for us, remembering this is the love. You want to see what the love looks like? It looks like him on the cross. That's what love looks like. Because my sin had to be dealt with. In the Old Testament, they're dealing with it with the animals and the sacrifice and all of that. Put your hand on the the head of that animal. They slit the throat. It's gory. It's horrible. You you probably wouldn't sin as much as you do if you had to do this. All right. Your sin is transferred to that animal. They then are going to kill that animal right in front of you as you have your hand on the head of that animal. All your sins are transferred to that animal. As the life is bled out of that animal, that's the idea is your sin is now being bled out of you to that animal. I think I'd sin a lot less if that was happening. I'd run out of, I'd, I would lose my entire herd in a week anyway. So, so, you know, like, oh, I sinned again. Here's another one, you know. And so, no, you know, 
But he that knew no sin became sin for us. When he died upon that cross, he took our sins upon himself. That's a hard concept to, to fully understand. And I don't know that we'll ever fully understand it except to say this, thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. And when I hold on to the bread and hold on to the cup, I'm remembering what he's done. I'm remembering his life, his life that was, was shed for us. I'm remembering those things. But as I'm holding on to the cup, I'm also thinking of, the, I'm also thinking of this. Lord, help me, to, help me live a life that honors that. How do I live my life in such a way that honors what you've done for me? I don't want to play games with Christianity. I don't want to play games with being religious. What I really want to do is, Lord, help me to live a life that honors you. So when you hold on to these things, remember who he is, merciful and gracious and long-suffering. Remember how much he loves you. Remember how passionate and in love he is of you. And if you forget that, go back to the cross because that's the great love that he has for you. But then flip it around. And let's do this together. As, as I prayed this, I have prayed this hundreds of times. I've prayed it with you so many times. It's the psalmist prayer. And it's, it's, a, it's probably my number one prayer for really focusing on God. And it's that, search me, O oh God. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. And know my anxious thoughts. And Lord, see if there's any offensive way in me. And Lord, lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, search me, O oh God, and know my heart. We're going to, again, we're going to remember what he's done because that's what he told us to do. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're remembering what he's done. But don't be afraid to do this. And maybe there's some things you need to change. Maybe there's some things you need to work on. Great. This is like a support group for a bunch of sinners you know, oh, look at us. We're the cool church. No, we're, we're, we're a bunch of sinners saved by grace. Oh, Lord, help us. I rambled through this, Lord, this, this precious jewel you gave us in this, this book of Exodus, Lord, of who you are. But, Lord, you're also showing us who we are. So, Lord, we pray together this prayer and pray this with me between you and God. Search me, O oh God. I know my heart. Know my anxieties. And Lord, see if there's any offensive way in me. Change me, Lord. And Lord, lead me in the way everlasting. That's our prayer, Lord. That's our prayer. Hold on to the cup. Hold on to the bread when it comes around. And we'll, we'll pray together.